Join Time Magazine's lead education reporter alongside global educators and advocates to explore the impacts of teaching forgiveness. I teach forgiveness because it can have a positive impact in my students' families. It helps my students thrive in the face of adversity. Students who can forgive are happier. Join us to hear from teachers and thought leaders on how and why to include forgiveness in your classroom. Temperature rise will bring widespread devastation and unprecedented extreme weather. New coronavirus cases emerge across the country. Obesity rates have more than doubled in kids. Cape Town is running out of water.
Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Riley, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to Teaching Forgiveness, Learning to Thrive, a World Education Week event hosted by the Templeton World Charity Foundation. I'm a reporter for Time Magazine, where I cover national news and education. My reporting over the last year has focused on how the pandemic affected education and how teachers adapted to meet students' needs both inside and outside of the classroom. The focus of those who teach forgiveness is similar. Today, we'll speak with a few educators from around the world who have found ways to make forgiveness a part of their teaching practice and have seen it affect their students for the better. We'll also hear from the co-founder and CEO of Ubongo, a leading producer of educational content that reaches children across 40 countries in Africa. But before we dive into those discussions, a few housekeeping notes. First, during today's event, we'll be using a live audience engagement tool through Mentimeter to ask questions about your own thoughts on forgiveness and whether you have or would like to incorporate it into your own teaching practice. Um, our first question, which you can answer by following the forgivenessforum.com link in the chat and opening it in a new browser window, uh, asks, would you consider integrating forgiveness lessons into your practice? Uh, secondly, we'd like to hear from you. We'll be taking questions from the audience during our panel discussions, so please feel free to ask your questions in the chat and share your thoughts on social media using hashtag Forgiveness Forum. This is the third in the Templeton World Charity Foundation series of Forgiveness Forum events. Uh, and after today's conversation, you can visit forgivenessforum.com where you can find links to resources and additional forum videos. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Sarazin, president of the Templeton World Charity Foundation and the host of today's event. Thank you, Katie, uh, and welcome to this session on teaching forgiveness, learning to thrive. We're so glad uh, that you and the rest of the panelists uh, have joined us, and we're super thrilled to partner with World Education Week as a sponsor of the world's best school prize for overcoming adversity, because we know that now more than ever, it is not easy to be a teacher. I think a unique feature of the past year and, and a half it, it is that it has nudged us, so many of us, into a period of introspection and reassessment. We've become painfully aware of our own imperfections, the ways in which we might have been hurt, and in turn may have hurt others. And in this time of disruption, we've asked some fundamental questions. What makes life worth living? What is education for? What should I live for and why? How can I overcome adversity in my own life and help others to do the same? In short, we've asked, how can we flourish, not just survive? And so that at the Templeton World Charity Foundation, where I'm president, we think these are essential questions about life with implications for life. And although not everyone asks these questions explicitly, the choices we make every day provide an implicit and resounding answer to them. But despite their importance, the questions at the heart of human flourishing are woefully neglected. And so the mission of the Templeton World Charity Foundation is to bridge this gap between research, practice, and policy to seek and support the world's best minds and institutions in the pursuit of human flourishing. And we've dedicated $60 million to this effort over the next five years. The Templeton World Charity Foundation is a global philanthropy based proudly in the island nation of the Bahamas, but we have over 200 projects in more than 50 countries. We fund cutting edge research on machine learning and moral decision making, the development of altruism in young children, the neural signatures of consciousness, how to make science more effective and efficient, and so much more. You can go to templetonworldcharity.org to find out uh, and learn more. But importantly, discoveries and research are not enough. We're interested in building an evidence base that connects what we call the habits of mind and heart to actions that can accelerate progress on indicators uh, of social change and prosperity. Some examples could include studies that link gratitude to climate action or humility to vaccine hesitancy or hope to health outcomes. But one of the most important habits of the mind and heart is that of forgiveness. Psychologists define forgiveness as a reduction in vengeful thoughts and feelings 
that is in accompanied by an increase in positive thoughts and feelings towards an offending person. I think of this as a kind of psychological alchemy that turns emotional garbage into gold. And I believe that this is a universal skill for living and flourishing as a human today. For over 20 years, the Templeton Philanthropies has supported research on forgiveness, and much of this work has been coordinated and funded by our sister organization, the John Templeton Foundation. And we owe a great debt to pioneers of this research, like Everett Worthington and Robert Enright and the International Forgiveness Institute. More than 50 studies conducted around the world have found that forgiveness interventions improve mental health outcomes, such as depression, anger, hostility, and stress. And so the science is clear. Forgiveness works. But the key question is, how do we learn to forgive? How do we connect research to practice and lived experience? And that brings us to today, which is our third forgiveness forum. In previous iterations, we've explored the role of forgiveness in the lives of world leaders and their nations. We've dispelled common misconceptions about forgiveness with leading mental health advocates and influencers. And now today, we're joined by some of the best teachers in the world as part of World Education Week who have integrated forgiveness into their classrooms. And so with them, I look forward to diving into a number of questions, including can forgiveness enhance academic achievement? How can forgiveness support teacher well-being? Does forgiveness build resilience and help students overcome adversity? And what are the most critical lessons that students need to learn today to become the future leaders of tomorrow? So as Katie mentioned, throughout this one hour conversation, please share your thoughts and questions in the chat, connect with other teachers, and uh, we look forward to your thoughts. So back to you, Katie, and on to the panel. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, we'll hear from you again at the end of today's event, uh, but for now, I'm pleased to introduce some of the members uh, doing that forgiveness work that you just described. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peli Galidi of Greece, Dr. Kofi Marfo of Ghana, and Annette Shannon of Northern Ireland. Uh, to give you all a brief introduction uh, to our educators, Dr. Galidi is a researcher, educator, and author from Athens. She is a former high school teacher and a school counselor with a master's degree in school psychology and a PhD in educational psychology. She is the Greek Forgiveness Education Program Director for the International Forgiveness Institute and has trained more than 600 teachers on implementing a forgiveness curriculum in their classrooms. Dr. Marfo is co-chair of Templeton's Forgiveness Scientific Advisory Council and an expert in early childhood development who has taught educational and developmental psychology at six universities in Canada, the United States, Africa, and Asia during his 42-year career. And Annette Shannon is a teacher at Holy Cross Primary School in Belfast, one of the first schools in the country to adopt the forgiveness curriculum of Dr. Robert Enright, who pioneered the scientific study of forgiveness. Annette has used the program to help repair strained student family relationships and to ease religious tensions in the school's mixed faith community. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, Pelly, I'd like to start with you. Given your background, both in the classroom and as a leader of professional development for other teachers, I wonder if you could explain how forgiveness factors into education. Why do you think forgiveness is something educators should be thinking about? So thank you, Katie. Thank you for inviting me to talk about forgiveness, about this great topic. And I believe so much, I strongly believe that forgiveness education can change the lives of our students, can change the world, actually. So um, it's not just me, it's science. As Andrew said before, science says clear, forgiveness works. And it really works. We have so many publications that demonstrate the benefits of forgiveness education on the student's life and the classroom climate uh, and the families also. So throughout my eight years of teaching forgiveness and training the teachers actually to teach forgiveness, I have seen miracles happening in the rooms, in the classrooms, between the students, in their personal life, also within their families. So what happens is that forgiveness reduces anger. And as we know, behind any delinquent behavior, there is an unresolved anger. So anger can very easily become resentment. And this 
can become contagious. So we can pass our hate and our resentment to others the same way we can pass love and compassion to the others. So um, we, when, when resentment remains inside us, then it affects not only us or the family or the school environment, but it affects also the whole, this, the whole community. So we can work alongside with justice. It's not separate. They can work together, justice and forgiveness. And we can bring peace in the heart of the victims, in their families, and in the community. So forgiveness reduces anger and increases collaboration, as all the research proves to us and demonstrates. It increases self-control. It helps develop empathy, develop interpersonal skills. But most of all, it alleviates bullying problems in the schools and is preventive. Uh, for violence. So it, it's not only preventive, mm -hmm. but we have seen also that it can heal the uh, students from past emotional wounds. So this is a major reason, I think, for educators to choose forgiveness in their curriculum. And Annette, I'm curious for you as a primary school teacher, uh, why has forgiveness become important to you? How did you begin the process of incorporating forgiveness into your curriculum and introducing this concept to your students? Hello, Katie. Well, um, I would have to say that in our school, one of the key elements to our teaching is developing and responding to relationships within your classroom. So in our school, we have children from four to 11 years of age. And we learned through experience that unless we explicitly taught children values, respect, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, that they would be disadvantaged as adults. Dr. Marfo, I'm curious, looking at this from the perspective of early childhood development, why is it important to introduce the concept of forgiveness during those early childhood years? Uh, first of all, let me uh, begin by emphasizing that the first several years of development are a very crucial period for building the foundations of optimal health, development and learning, and therefore also for building the foundations for personal flourishing and the societal human capital development necessary for broad social and economic well-being. Uh, bringing attention to the early years, from my perspective, is an important period for seeding and nurturing character development. It's my way of encouraging nation states to rethink the dominant view of education as a process that one, begins when children enter school, and two, predominantly entails the acquisition of academic, linguistic, and cognitive competencies. Um, I think too much of our societal thinking about the concept of school readiness, for example, tends to be about children being ready to enter school. And that often translates into expecting children to arrive in school already equipped with the behaviors and competencies supportive of academic learning. Within that mindset, children considered unable to acquire literacy and numeracy skills swiftly become pathologized. They are said to have deficits that get in the way of attaining their potential. Now, I have intentionally decided to address these issues because I think they are very foundational to the uh, very noble efforts to build the values arena within our educational system and forgiveness being our topic for today. There are two forms of readiness in our educational settings. Uh, both of them require deliberate investments in the early years of development. The first is readiness for children on the part of nations and communities. If we're going to have children who are flourishing and are doing well in societies that are flourishing, society has to be ready for children to begin with. Societies that are ready for children build comprehensive systems of nurturing care to provide for the health, nutrition, development, protection, and early learning needs of all children, including matters of the heart, which we express by way of values. Mm -hmm. The second form of neglected readiness is readiness on the part of schools for the children they seek to educate. An education system with schools that are for children prepare educators and school professionals to understand the interconnectedness of family, community, and school context as education environments. 
to be supported and coordinate the benefit of developing and learning uh, of the learning child. Um, so at some point, I think Annette uh, and I will probably come back and address this issue uh, of the role of schools and the family and community. I personally like to see a way to bring these entities together and charge all entities as having responsibility uh, for raising children, not only in cognition, but also in matters of the heart. Mm -hmm. Now, in such um, systems, yeah, yeah. Now, when you consider systems that need to be ready for school, then society has a responsibility to strengthen schools and their practices to enhance children's learning, rather than spending money and time identifying the deficits that prevent children from doing well in, in, in life to begin with. Okay, so in a mm -hmm. nutshell, my answer to your first question is that educators can help by bringing a systems perspective to their work and build bridges to connect the socialization and educational processes that occur within families, communities. That system view also informs my answer to your second question, whether our focus is on forgiveness specifically or on character development broadly. The nurturing of values is a multi-arena, multi-agent, multi-system activity. Family, community, and school contests, along with the culture of major social institutions like our legal, legislative, and public arenas, have a role to play. Mm -hmm. Um, and Pelly, I'll, I'll come back to you. I'm curious to give everyone a sense of what forgiveness education means in practice. Can you illustrate for us what it actually looks like in a classroom? What kind of lessons are you using to teach forgiveness? Well, forgiveness education has expanded to in Greece to become an, uh, a, a, a nationally uh, implemented uh, program. Over 700 teachers have already been trained in education and thousands mm -hmm. have been uh, participated in this program. So we're following Dr. Enright's lessons, the curriculum from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, but we have adapted the curriculum. So many of the themes that uh, they use for forgiveness education are based on Aristotle's uh, theory about uh, uh, moral, moral ethics, and we're as Greeks to have this background, but still uh, we have created both based on the unique Greek uh, So, uh, it, to be effective for the, the students must have a clear definition of what forgiveness is. So, we, we need to know forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. But there is and then we start, the teacher introduces the concepts, this is the theory, and introduces the concepts, concepts of forgiveness that, that underline food and forgiveness. We start with other things like inherent work, generally, core empathy, gratitude, and we mention explicitly about forgiveness, the word forgiveness. And then uh, the teacher tells the students stories. So forgiveness education is usually taught through the forms of stories. And through a story, first of all, they identify with a character, with a hero, and then they are challenged to see beyond the surface, to see the worth of the person that lies underneath. And they be to see that's, so that's how it works. And then the third part is the, as we call them, experiential exercises, or the, the practice that they choose through processing of the stories, ethical dilemma. Many like they do in the class in the safe environment of the class. The aim is to help the injured person to think about the offender in a broader way. That of the call reframing. And Annette, I'll come back to you. I'm sorry we interrupted sorry. your answer previously, but I'm curious, what are some of the lessons and activities you've found to be most effective as you've been teaching forgiveness to your students? Uh, I think that all the lessons, I have to say, and being perfectly honest, all the lessons that I've 
taught have been effective, but those which have the greatest impact often occur kind of um, in the middle or at the end of a particular text. As Dr. Galidi was saying, we use stories a lot with Dr. Enright's programme. The children at that stage are used to the format. They're ready to listen. They're ready to join in with the discussions. And in each session, um, more and more hands go up. More children want to have their voices heard, even the quietest ones. So um, that's great for us as teachers to see. But also their listening improves. So you can see them actively listening to the opinions and thoughts of the other children and then responding to them. Um, the questions that are already within the programme, because it all comes set up for you. So the questions within the programme really allow you to tease out the ideas carefully, carefully and sensitively because it's a sensitive topic. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, an example of this would be Dr. Enright's own story, The Tiger in the Tall Grass. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's where family relationships are laid bare. Um, and some of the young people really could see maybe even for the first time, the impact and the consequences of behaviour through the generations of a family. And they were able to discuss passionately, um, the, or co compassionately, the breakdown of relationships and the power of forgiveness in allowing the relationships in the family to heal. And I wonder, Annette, I know you've mentioned before that it might be hard to get buy-in for this kind of program at some schools because it is not a core class like math or science, and it's not something you can necessarily measure on a test. I'm curious what your response is to that. Why do you think it's important to teach forgiveness anyway? Well, I have to say I teach, I'm very fortunate to teach in a wonderful school that has always had a visionary kind of uh, uh, leadership team and they they always looked to meet whatever new needs came along so whenever we saw the forgiveness program we rec they recognized the potential and got everybody on board and I know that's hard in some places really like you know you don't always have that support behind you and um, this program to me is perfect because you need very little money and I don't know about other schools but in schools like ours we don't t tend to have a lot of money so um I mean a lot of the texts we buy second hand you know mm -hmm. that, that you can get books for nothing these days um the as I said all the questioning all the materials that go along with the program from the Forgiveness Institute they're they're terrific but they're also very flexible so it means that you can really adapt this program to whatever the needs of your children are. And I know that's what our staff have done. You know, there may be mm -hmm. things that they've left out, things that they've had to add in, you know, but that's that's all, that's really possible. You know, mm -hmm. I think that an another plus that I would say is, is it really helps develop the, um, the teacher-student bond, you know, because the children will open up to you and forgiveness education in a way that they won't in any other subject that you will do, you know? Yeah. And as I find, the more you go into it, really, the more that they will learn to trust you. And actually, you'll see a lot of, you know, maybe the issues that have been holding them back, you know, and that's going to help children, whether or not it's going to increase a percentage or decrease a percentage or, you know, fix a score, those children are going to be more focused. They're going to be more able to deal with adversity and they're going to be able to learn more effectively. Mm -hmm. That's such an interesting point, Annette. Um, and for our audience, we'll be transitioning into the open Q&A portion shortly. So please feel free to add your questions into the chat if you haven't already. Um, but I'll, I'll turn back to Pelly. I'm curious if I know you mentioned at the start of this conversation that you've seen miracles happen when teaching forgiveness. And I wonder if you could share an example or a story about the kind of impact forgiveness education can have. Um, how does the introduction of forgiveness make a difference in students' lives and in classrooms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Katie. It's it's amazing. Yeah, I have seen miracles and there are so many stories I could share. It's hard to choose one from all the, all the stories. So um, there was this 15-year-old student 
who uh, was very angry with his dad. He was living with his mom. The dad has abandoned them about 10 years ago. And uh, there was a lot of hate toward, towards this person, towards the dad. However, uh, what happens is that uh, the mother becomes sick. She goes to the doctor and the prognosis is very bad. The doctor gives her just three months of life. She, she becomes devastated. She is desperate. She needs something to do now. And she has to turn back to the father so that they reconnect with the child. So, but how is she going to do this? This was very hard for them. So she goes to the principal of the school and the principal refers her to the forgiveness education teacher. So the teacher didn't do something special. She just um, taught forgiveness. The child was silent at the beginning, just sitting and not talking. But suddenly after a fifth or sixth session, something happens and the child, something moves him. Actually, they show uh, a, a sculpture from uh, Alexander Milov that has two people that sit on the back and uh, back to back. And then there are two small children uh, hugging each other inside. That, and that means that everyone has a small child inside that wants you know, affection and love. So, and this touches so much the little uh, student. And uh, he says to the teacher, please, can you draw this? I want to see it every time so that I get strength from this. So what happens is that after a while he meets with his father and he was not angry, he was not aggressive. So the father didn't have to be defensive also. And the new relationship starts. Then they include the mom also after a few meetings, mom is also included. And what happens at the end is that the family reunites and the teacher says that to me, we have reunited the family through forgiveness education program. And she was even crying, the teacher. I mean, that, that was amazing. And everybody mm -hmm. was so very excited. And the happy end is that the mother became healed. She didn't die, as the doctor said, and she became healed. And so they get they reconnected. It sounds like a miracle, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, it doesn't happen every day, those things. But we have seen many, many stories like that. And this is the amazing part of the program. Mm -hmm. And I, I know, as we've discussed today, it's not all about academic outcomes, but how do you see forgiveness affecting students' ability to learn and their academic achievement? Mm -hmm. um, forgiveness education, we have to keep in mind that is empiric an empirically um, verifying treatment. That means that it's scientific and it works scientifically. So we have many publications. And men in many countries that prove exactly that forgiveness education not only reduces anger and uh, improves uh, collaboration between the students, but also improves the academic uh, ach achievement, especially by at risk, uh, high risk students. So we have a, a research done in Milwaukee, in uh, Korea, in Ireland also, in many countries of the world that prove that forgiveness education also increases academic achievement. Mm -hmm. um, and Kofi, I'll come back to you one more time. Um, I'd like to ask for your big picture perspective on this. When you look at the challenges we face in the world right now, what's at stake if schools don't prioritize forgiveness? And why is it important that we start to value this more in education? Okay. Th thank you very much, uh, Katie. Again, permit me to place uh, forgiveness education in the larger context of character development broadly, because this is a very important issue. Uh, and my reason for doing this is both philosophical and pedagogical. Now, trying to find space in the traditional school curriculum for anything important that falls outside conventional content is very, very true. And so part of what I like to see us do is to begin to think about, you know, broader conceptions of values education of which forgiveness will be inclusive, and finding methodologies for immersing our students and our children in a culture that nurtures these uh, uh, competencies and values. So with that said, let me make a case for nurturing character and value traits, including forgiveness that I, I hope you find compelling. I want you all to think about advances in science and technology that you have witnessed personally over the past 30 years. Things that you experienced. Uh, if I had time, I would have told you about my first week in Canada trying to call home, and it took about five days to be able to talk to somebody, right? Uh, now, in spite of the widespread dissatisfaction that we have with education systems around the world, these systems have managed to produce individuals who are exceptionally talented 
academically, linguistically, cognitively, who are driving these advances that we see around us. But next, I want you to think about what you consider as daunting problems facing the world in the same 30-year period. For my bi-advantage point, notwithstanding the phenomenal scientific and technological advances I have mentioned, we live in an uncertain world characterized by insensitivity, marginalization, injustice, violence, terrorism, massive corruption at the highest levels of government you know, globally. To face these mm -hmm. challenges head on, our systems of socialization and education must also produce individuals with strong social, emotional, and cap uh, character capital who are capable of placing themselves in the shoes of others, valuing mm -hmm. the common good and understanding their own contributions to the promotion of that common good and possessing the courage and humility to appreciate the legitimacy of ideas and practices and values other than one's own. These are important challenges of our times. There is no better time to nurture these attributes and lay the foundation for a culture of forgiving than the earliest years of children's development. And there are no better contests to do this than within societies in which systems of care, education, and governance are grounded in the value of investing adequately in families, communities, and schools to seamlessly support children's holistic development of competencies, values, and dispositions that make for peace, justice, and around the world. And that's where my thoughts are. And as a learner, uh, I'm delighted you know, to be on the same panel with people who are actually on the forefront doing this work. Uh, the questions I have additionally entail, what do we do about school structures and the school culture and the school climate? Are there ways to configure our school environments in a manner that ensures that the teaching of these values are done through immersion in addition to direct instruction? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Kofi. And now I'd like to invite our audience to use our audience engagement tool once again and weigh in on another round of questions. The first being, do you think a student's ability to forgive is important for their social and emotional well-being? And number two, do you think your school community would be interested in or supportive of forgiveness education? Um, now I have a question from our audience. Uh, for, for any of the panelists who'd like to answer this, how do you think the concept of forgiveness as it is taught to children varies culturally in terms of what one can forgive and how to forgive. Pelly, we'll start with you if you want to if you want to start with an answer to that one. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there is a lot of research again uh, throughout all the cultures. So forgiveness work, works in every culture, and we can see that. Of course, we need to do cultural adaptations. Uh, I would like to, to say that the uh, definition of forgiveness for the Greek language might be a little bit different than of the English language, because uh, forgiveness, if you analyze the word, the etymology of the word is uh, making space to include everyone. That's what it means, forgiveness. While in English, it has the word give. It's like giving a gift to someone, giving the gift of forgiveness. So we focus a lot by doing this analysis of the of the word, the etymology. We focus a lot on on how we are going to include everyone in our heart, even our enemies, even the people that have harmed us. So that's the basic uh, concept for the Greek definition of forgiveness. And uh, I'm sure there might be different uh, concepts uh, and the approach in different cultures, but that's how we approach it. And we say that you have to. We, we, we also promote the ideas of humility, of generosity. You know, all those things are very specific uh, values that we need to have in order to forgive. So that's how we approach it in, in, in Greece. In Greece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Pelly. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for right now. But I want to say thank you again to our audience for your questions. Thank you to our panelists for your insights on forgiveness education and its implications for the social emotional development of students across the world. Um, I'd like to, to introduce our final audience question for you all. Having listened to today's panel, has your perception of forgiveness education changed? Uh, so feel free to weigh in on that. Um, and with that, I will um, hand this off back to Andrew with the Templeton World Charity Foundation.
Thanks, Katie. Uh, and thanks um, for the amazing panel of educators, uh, Dr. Galiti Mishanin and uh, Dr. Marfo. Uh, I think you really helped us illustrate what forgiveness means in practice, situating it in the context of challenges that schools face today and in, also in the context of, of broader childhood uh, and adolescent development. Um, to help us reflect on what we've heard today, it's my honor uh, and pleasure to introduce Nisha Ligon, who is the co-founder and CEO of Ubongo, uh, which is a premier producer of engaging, entertaining, and educational content for kids. Um, Ubongo reaches nearly 25 million households every week with video and radio content in nine languages across Africa. Nisha joins us from Tanzania today. Um, we first got introduced um, a few years ago uh, through an interest in the virtue of Utu, which is a concept coming from the culture and wisdom of Southern Africa. The foundation is very interested in, um, in character strengths or virtues around the world and the adaptation of those in, in, and meaning of those in certain uh, contexts. Nisha has an amazing background in media and science and a passion for education. She's produced great content for the BBC Guardian, many online learning platforms, uh, and as well as an online, as a award-winning documentary, uh, Twiga Stars. So at Ubongo, she's the lead visionary, uh, series producer and screenwriter that brings dynamic videos to people, uh, young people and their families. So thank you, Nisha, for joining us today. Um, first, just tell thank us a little bit me. about uh, your, yeah, very welcome. Um, tell us a little bit about Ubongo uh, and, um, you know, the content you produce uh, and, and spread, you know, really on a, a daily basis. Sure, thanks for the introduction, and I think you covered a lot of it. Um, the main thing to know is that we create child-centered, um, child-driven African edutainment uh, that we really say we co-create with and for kids. Um, it's edutainment, so it's educational and entertaining um, and very driven. And, you know, we started out with math and then some sub expanded to cover more of character development and social emotional learning. The, the truth of the matter, it's something that's always been integral to our content because we are story based. We're making these educational cartoons and dramas and, and what creates drama, it's character, it's, it's conflict and it's also forgiveness. And so there's always been this element of um, kind of character learning and, and social emotional learning within our, our programs, but uh, we've got much more explicit about it over the years in really trying to um, talk about specific virtues, um, talk about different character strengths. Uh, and it's it's so exciting to be part of this forum and to have learned about forgiveness education because it's definitely something that, that we're seeing a potential benefit from and that we'd love to incorporate into our content in the future. Yeah, so, so sort of piggybacking up uh, off of that, um... Could you reflect a little bit about what you've heard and, and what you've read about forgiveness education? Uh, for example, you know, if you were to produce an episode um, on forgiveness, what's the content creation process like? What would you need uh, from of in terms of resources, uh, and where would you begin uh, in that in that process? Yeah, so something that we always try to do is also do this connection of research to practice. So I'm someone who, you know, I have a background in science. I love to go digging into the literature and learning more about the science and neuroscience behind these things. Um, but what I've really learned over the years is that's only half of it. The other half is that it needs to come from our audience and the kids themselves. Um, so our general process is that we will work um, with kind of both the experts and beneficiaries, uh, the kids and parents, to identify what are priority topics. Um, so something like forgiveness um, could become a priority topic. Um, and given all of the research um, that's been done, it, it seems likely that it will be. Uh, and then we go back to the kids to really understand what is their point of view? What is their understanding of this? There, there are so many different elements that have already been mentioned, like Dr. Galiti mentioned language, right? So we produce in Kiswahili and Hausa and Isizulu and other languages. So we have to understand also, what does forgiveness mean in their language? And is there any kind of different context around that? Um, also the cultural context. We're in Tanzania um, where 
you know, kids might have a different point of view on forgiveness from other populations we work with, like refugee children um, who are coming from South Sudan or DR Congo or, say, South Africa, um, where there's a very different legacy and, and point of view around forgiveness. So um, we want to do sessions with kids in different countries and, and really do a lot of listening to understand what does this mean to them um, and what are their stories around it. We find that kids' own stories, um, either real life or fictional, are always a great starting off place for us. Um, and then we as writers will work to craft storylines. Uh, which we take back to kids. So so we always tell something as a story before making an animated cartoon of it. Uh, it's a lot of investment to do animation, but telling stories is easy and iterative and we, and we can make um, sometimes many different uh, story ideas around a topic and test those with kids and then ask them questions and have a discussion afterwards to know what they've learned. And so it's kind of through that process that we then get to a script, which we usually try and um, get vetted and checked by people in the field um, who can also, you know, bring that kind of um, outside point of view on on the teaching of certain topic or, or potential pitfalls in, in doing that, as well as the feedback from our audience themselves. Um, and then after that, it goes through a kind of production process where we will record, animate. Um, we always integrate songs and we find that for character strength, songs are, are a wonderful way to kind of reinforce um, the, their power and, and really make things memorable for kids. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully get to a finished product, which, which can then go out to our audience. The last thing I would add with that is what we've been doing on our latest season of Ubongo Kids, which is the one around Utu, um, is adding activities um, and very specific things that kids can practice that we give them at the end of the show and encourage them to do. Because we know that just hearing and learning about something is only the first step and giving them really um, prompts and ways to go out and practice these skills uh, is really what's going to reinforce it and, and help them understand how it's meaningful in their own lives. Hmm. No, it's um, you know the importance of focusing on songs and characters and role models and uh, you know and and activities. Um, you know, it it it's a very powerful process to engage both the cog cognitive aspects of of human nature uh, in order to know something, but it takes a whole different sort of set of, of resources to you know to to make the body feel something uh and and through that process of both co you know cognitive and emotional learning um you know at least in the case of forgiveness you get you get real results um zooming out just a bit you know you mentioned you, you your work focuses a lot on listening to kids um sort of what's your view on 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 the pandemic and how um you know what are kids thinking about you, have you noticed a change in terms of the questions kids are asking uh, throughout the past two years, and uh, I, I feel like you you have um, quite a a unique viewpoint on on um, sort of what's on the mind of children across across Africa. Sure, um, we've seen a huge amount of engagement around these concepts of Utu um, and shared humanity uh, and kind of the social emotional side of things. Um, during the pandemic, it's hard to have causality because I think we jumped even harder into that area and really reinforced it um, while the pandemic was happening because we saw a lot of demand from parents and from teachers. Um, and so we have seen really strong engagement from kids um, around those areas, though I, I'm not sure whether it's specifically because of the pandemic or because we've also been reinforcing them more. Um, there's also just, in general, this, um, I think, desire for kids to know what's going on, be included in the conversation, um, be told um, the truth. And we, a lot of the content we've been doing this period has also been focused on parents and giving parents the skills and support and encouragement to just talk to their children. Um, during a really scary time, it can be tempting to try and, you know, protect them or cocoon them and, and not really talk about what might be going on, whether it's from a health point of view or more from a mental health and, and well-being point of view. Um, and so so trying to facilitate those conversations and, and give parents and kids uh, 
um, tools and starting points for talking to each other, telling stories with each other, um, sharing has has been something that's been really critical um, because at, we we really find from kids that if being left in the dark um, only only makes some of the stress worse, and so. Um, there's just that desire to want to be included in the conversation, wanting to understand what's going on, um, and then also wanting to be heard. Mm. I know you've done a, a, also done a lot of work on other sensitive issues like HIV or gender, um, you know, with with kids. And I, I'm so glad you brought up the issue of of, of inclusion of adults and, and other uh, and, you know, parents and coaches, um, the, the adults that surround children. Um, you know, how do you respond to pushback from from those adults? Again, kind of uh, the, the perspective that, um, you know, that, that you just mentioned of, of not trying to insulate children from what's going on, trying to include them in, in conversations. Um, I can imagine in the case of forgiveness that that's, you know, you, that teachers, uh, you know, or, or other educators around the world might also face similar pushback. How do you how do you kind of navigate that? Uh, what can be a very tricky situation? Um, with adults about you know the point you made of in, including kids in, in in what just might be you know difficult and um, and potentially really challenging conversation. Yeah, well, one thing that's really exciting about our shows and programs is like a lab for testing some of these things out. You know, it takes years to get something approved to put into a curriculum, but we're informal outside of the education system and and a bit of a place. Um, to to try things out where it's a bit safer. Um, and also we have wonderful feedback mechanisms. We got a lot of SMS um, writing in, call-ins from parents. So so we're able to address some of these topics and, and, and also identify potential pitfalls with them. Uh, and actually to do that at scale. And I think that's, that's something that's quite important. Um, we did an episode this year where one of our most beloved characters, um, Kibena, who you know, kids have now been watching for seven years, um, have formed a really strong relationship with. They they learned that she is HIV positive and and was born with HIV, and and we really prepared ourselves for a lot of pushback um, based upon you know input we've gotten from kind of uh, experts and teachers who were concerned about um, you know how would parents receive this. Um, we, 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 of course, did this child-centered um, approach to developing the storyline. And actually, we didn't have to use any of these kind of materials that, that we'd been preparing to respond to negative criticism because it actually didn't come up. And I'm, I'm sure there were maybe people who, who thought differently. Um, but in terms of the dialogue that happened around the program, through our SMS, through social media, um, it was actually incredibly positive. And, and a lot of people thanking us for having these conversations that sometimes they don't know how to have with their, their kids. Um, so, so that's something that's actually pleasantly surprised us throughout this season was that even though we, we hit on some really tough topics, um, it was really well received for the most part, I think, um, A, because we kind of established that relationship over many years and, and slowly went into it, and, and B, because we did community-led storytelling, um, ensured that the stories were developed in a way that was relevant and, and local. Um, and actually, now we have some data points to kind of come back to people in the education sector who might have said, you can't do this and show, hey, we were able to do this on national TV across 10 countries um, and it was accepted. So rather than just saying, no, not, let's not talk about it for the curriculum, um, here's a starting point that we can work mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nisha. Any, any last final, um, any final tips for teachers? Uh, who who've tuned in today, you know, may, maybe are, are thinking about forgiveness, thinking about trying to integrate this into their curriculum, um, being a kind of master uh, storyteller, a creator of characters, creator of narratives. Any just final final tips uh, for for others who who might um, be willing to dip their toe in the water here to uh, you know to to deliver um, you know a little bit of this sort of forgiveness message to their students. Sure. I would just say, I mean, what we always come back to when we're stuck is, is let the kids play. Um, I think a lot of us have this um, tendency to want to have it all figured out. 
um, before we come to the students and the kids. And, and actually what we learn is that being a little bit more open about, um, this is something that we're still figuring out. What are your thoughts, including them in the conversation, um, is a, actually a much stronger starting point it feel engaged and empowered and also helps us to better understand um, their point of view of things to be able to better teach it rather than trying to, you know, perfect everything uh, before we then roll it out to students. Um, and especially with forgiveness, right? Uh, they can be forgiving of us, us making mistakes and getting it wrong. And um, having that open channel of feedback is, is so important. So um, I would encourage people, one of our, our principles at Ubongo is fail fast, fail forward. Um, and that, you know, sometimes it's just about taking the first step and asking the kids, hey, um, how would you feel about us learning about this? Um, wh what are some of your thoughts here? And getting some of that early feedback so that we can fail forwards, um, even if it's not working, towards something that, that is going to work. Um, so yeah, listen to the kids and let them lead the way. Thank you, Nisha. Um, we're reminded of one of my favorite quotes about story of forgiveness of a parent talking with her, uh, her three-year-old daughter. She said that, you know, I, I forgive you, mommy, because my heart has a tummy ache and I don't want it to hurt anymore. <laughs> so uh, you can learn a lot from children as, as a dad of three young boys. Um, I'm certainly grateful for your work and your leadership uh, in, tr in trying to empower a generation of, of more caring, more empathetic um, kids around the world, uh, specifically in Africa. It's hard work and I'm super grateful for it. So thanks for joining today. Um, and so um, I'm just gonna uh, sort of sum up here uh, 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 with a word of thanks to our panel, um, uh, Dr. Kofi Marfo, Annette Shannon, Dr. Peli Galiti, uh, Nisha, uh, for offering great insights about sort of taking research and making it practical for, for teachers around the world, as well as Katie uh, Riley, our, our wonderful moderator of the panel discussion today. Um, I'm just gonna summarize a few of the high points of what I've heard. And, I, and it's basically the what, the why, and the how of forgiveness. Um, forgiveness is a process of both the head and the heart. It involves cognitive decisions to forgive. It also involves emotions um, that take a while and need um, a sort of a, a wide range of approaches. We've talked a little bit about what forgiveness isn't. It's not the same as reconciliation and dialogue. It is not the same as justice. It is a unilateral action that individuals can take uh, to move past traumatic experiences, and it can be delivered in the classroom. We've talked a little bit about uh, what is ex at stake if we don't prioritize forgiveness, uh, if we don't build, as Kofi said, um, a, a culture of care or systems of care to manage the unprecedented change uh, and the unprecedented adversity. Um, we we uh, talked a little bit about how schools might fill a gap. Uh, Annette said, you know, schools must be a place of, of safety and security and a, in a culture that nurtures. Uh, and where in the past we might have been able to, um, to rely on uh, other institutions, the schools are playing much more important role to navigating change uh, and, in, and connect schools, families, and students together. Uh, we've learned a little bit about um, how forgiveness can, at its root, um, address unresolved anger uh, and resentment. Uh, that can be contagious, but just as anger and resentment can be contagious, so, so can forgiveness uh, and love. We also talked about how, so how to experiment, how to fit it to the context, use local language. Uh, we've learned about the importance of stories that order our attention. Uh, I love the, the, con the, um, the, the mention of, of listening, that a really good listener creates a space for someone to express themselves. We've talked about the importance of a local champion. And so our speakers have uh, left us with so much to reflect on today. I'm so grateful. Uh, we wish we could have more time. Um, keep your eye on your email. Sign up at forgivenessforum.com for future updates and recordings uh, in the past. But as we close out here, on behalf of the Templeton World Charity Foundation uh, and World Education Week, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you are inspired to explore and bring forgiveness to the classroom. Thank you.
Join Time Magazine's lead education reporter alongside global educators and advocates to explore the impacts of teaching forgiveness. I teach forgiveness because it can have a positive impact in my students' families. It helps my students thrive in the face of adversity. Students who can forgive are happier. Join us to hear from teachers and thought leaders on how and why to include forgiveness in your classroom. rise will bring widespread devastation and unprecedented extreme weather. New coronavirus cases emerge across the country. Obesity rates have more than doubled in kids. Cape Town is running out of water. 